Hi, thank you for joining Companions on a Journey today for supporting your child through grief during COVID-19. We know that grief can be difficult at any time, but right now we're facing a lot of challenges. And that's why I'm excited that we're here today with Anne-Marie and Faith. They're two valuable members of our team who are going to speak to this topic and help equip you with some more tools for your grief. Thank you, Grace. Um, today we wanted to talk about uh, what, what's going on for children uh, during COVID-19, uh, children who are experiencing grief, and then on top of that, um, additions, additional secondary grief with COVID-19. Um, the first thing that we'd like to say is there is no right or wrong way for anyone to grieve, um, and children grieve differently than adults. And we'd like to talk about that, um, and that no two children actually grieve the same way, that you can have two children in your home um, who are grieving in very different ways. Uh, we, uh, we believe that a child who is old enough to love is old enough to grieve. So that can be from the time they are infants until the, you know, for the forever. Um, we know that children experience grief in many different ways. And so we'd like to explore that with you today. Faith is going to jump in at different points and help me out here to talk about yeah. some of the things that she's, um, she has experienced as she um, is one of our amazing bereavement counselors. So what I know about a child who is old enough to love is old enough to grieve is the fact that children grieve all different things that adults may not realize are grief worthy. So that puts children in a situation sometimes of grieving multiple things at the same time. So a child may grieve the loss of a pet. The child may grieve the loss of a best friend. The child may grieve the loss through moving or changing schools or moving to a new grade or not getting closure with people that they care about in their former grade. So all those different pieces make the grief a little bit more multi-layered for a child because anything that a child is capable of loving, they're capable of missing and grieving. So, and I, I've seen that experience and I've witnessed it in my own life. So I do know that that is part of uh, children's grief. And, and to keep in mind that grief um, also comes from loss and loss from experiences, especially during COVID-19, that uh, a child may be experiencing many different losses as they have um, through this. And we will go through those secondary losses and describe some of the losses that those children are experiencing and maybe delayed losses, um, delayed uh, expressions or, or reactions to their, uh, their loss. So some of the things that we know is that no matter um, how young or how old we are, we all grieve differently. Um, and while we see that uh, people we, we see people grieving losses um, and adults tend to understand grief uh, in a different way than children do. Um, no matter how old they are, anyone who loses someone or loses experiences um, has the ability to grieve. Um, children, and, yes. And the other piece to that, Anne-Marie, is that children don't always have the words. They don't always have the vocabulary to put things in words where grown-ups may have some words. Whether grown-ups realize what they're doing is grieving or not, um, children often lack vocabulary and lack the words to put into their feelings. Mm -hmm. And they may not know what grief is, but they are certainly feeling it. Um, and it, it is up to us as their parents, um, as their caretakers, to help to give them those words. Um, they, 
oftentimes will keep things quiet because they don't want to contribute to someone's sadness or to the overwhelming feelings that are going on, especially in COVID-19. Um, there are a lot of things that parents are juggling right now and caretakers are trying to make it all work. Um, I think it's a little easier today since school is out, but during that time, there were so many secondary losses that went on for those children. Um, there were losses of just the community that they went to every day, the routines that they experienced. And trying to navigate online learning has certainly been a challenge for so many children. Um, any ch child who has... Uh, ADHD or um, any kind of special needs may have found this a little more difficult or they may not have, but it really is such an individual process um, in just navigating online learning and not having that face-to-face -face, um, seeing your teacher every day. You know, I don't think parents realize until now how important teachers are in kids' lives and that while they're educating them, they are giving them so much more. They're giving them that love and that support and that kindness and that validation. Um, and so kids are getting it at home and they're getting it in their schools and they have lost that piece. And I think that's been very hard for them. Um, they, they, I'm sure they're feeling more isolated at this point, um, not having their friends around. And kids are very much about their peers and their support systems and uh, not having those experiences on a daily basis, not being able to just talk about, you know, the, the latest TikTok or, um, you know, anything that goes on in their worlds with someone um, who is their own age, I think has been a difficult experience for them. Um, I know that they, um, they're feeling more isolated. And, and what was surprising to me was for as technologically savvy as this generation is, um, Generation Z was not, in my experience, using the technology that was available to them. They, they went into these, these places of sadness and didn't feel like they really even wanted to use that technology where they, you know, you couldn't get a child off the phone before or off of FaceTime or, or whatever. And they just kind of shut down. Um, and they have to really respond to it. Absolutely. And uh, in my experience, the things that I found were that kids were not really using it to reach out to positive places. Um, mm -hmm. or places that would give them more coping skills. Um, the, the students that seem to do the best are the ones that would be using, for example, apps that would make things more positive or have them doing positive things with their day. Mm -hmm. Those students seem to be able to handle some of these secondary losses better. And some of those apps are um, Calm, uh, Mindfulness.org, Headspace, any of those, um, those apps that help with their emotional stability. Um, they, you're right. They, there were so many kids who were not even using that. They just, I think, kind of shut down out of fear. This happens so quickly. You know, one day they're in school and the next day they're not. Um, and just trying to navigate all of that, I think, has been a, a real experience for them. Um, and then we, so now we're, we're at the end of the school year and the celebrations that uh, our children should have experienced, you know, that just, even if they're not graduating, although graduations have been so compromised um, in terms of how um, different schools are doing things. Some are doing them face-to-face, -face, but social distancing. Some schools are doing them virtually. Um, and it just changes the whole experience, I think, both for kids and for their parents. I mean, there's, there's milestones that have been compromised. There's just general, you know, rite of passage, passage experiences 
that they did not get the opportunity to have proms and you know skip day for seniors and just all of the fun stuff that went on for seniors or eighth graders or even college students were not able to happen um, and they spent their whole lives getting there and then their celebrations of themselves um, and their accomplishments have been so compromised and i think that's been really hard on these kids um, yep and among the younger kids, even things like preschool and kindergarten graduation, yeah. if your siblings have had those graduations, so your parents and family have talked about, oh, there's kindergarten graduation. And for the middle schoolers, there's some rites of passage like trips to Washington, D.C., or some of the spring events that go on related to sports, sports banquets, mm -hmm. all those types of things. And in families, there are often rites of passage where it's kind of an expectation that each student, as they reach that milestone, will get that. So that also has really changed things for this particular year and this generation. And, and you bring up a good point, even something like birthdays, birthday celebrations, um, you know, just those simple things that um, seemed like, you know, something we would normally do, they can't happen. You know, you have to do it over Zoom now. Um, what sure. about the kids who um, couldn't do their sport in the spring? Right? Sure. They, they um, condition all year long for those sports and then they were not able to do them. So we're really trying to um, talk about adaptability and how we're adapting and we continue to adapt and we continue to try to be resilient um, as it, this pandemic continues to change and things open up or they don't open up and, and just trying to make the best of a situation, not knowing what the future is going to hold, I think is really a difficult experience. You know, the assumptions that we have about our world, um, where it is today and where it's going to be in, you know, six weeks or th three months from now, they, they're all kind of on hold. You know, there's that, that, feeling of like disconnectedness or, or fear or uncertainty that, you know, I knew that when I graduated high school, I was going to go to college. Kids don't know that at this point. And I think that's really so difficult to just the, the whole idea of waiting um, to see what's going to happen and not being able to plan for a lot of kids brings up so many grief issues. Um, Absolutely. So we need to... And the other thing that parents need to keep in mind is their flexibility, flexibility and resilience in this, in welcoming new birthday celebrations, in welcoming new ways to do this. We can acknowledge that this is different, but welcoming the idea that, hey, dropping off cupcakes at the door to each of your friends can be a positive birthday celebration this year and building into not building into disappointment but rather building into the positive aspects and finding thankfulness and gratitude in each situation that comes forward because understanding that helps us be more resilient and adaptable mm -hmm. i think that's a great idea faith you know to just um make some cupcakes and to bring them to your friend's door and say, I miss you. You know, I can't wait to see you. What a great way to celebrate friendships and love. Uh, well, people have been very, very creative. I can't take any of the ideas for myself, but I will tell you when you go through and look around and you truly look on Pinterest and some of these other things, people have been extremely creative in being able to welcome new forms, new flexible and adaptable forms to celebrate these milestones in a new way. And truthfully, if we embrace that, when we look back at it from our future and we look backwards, we'll say, wow, that was a really unique year. And, and it may not be as negative as it feels right now, when we have some distance from it, 
but being flexible and adaptable to new ideas. Absolutely. And I, I know for my family, one of the, the things that we're doing is we're collecting items to have a time capsule. Um, I had a, um, I have a freshman who's now going to be a sophomore in high school, but I also have a, a student who is, um, who graduated college. And so where they are in that process, um, we're going to put something, items in a time capsule so that they have them for their, their kids. Um, we have shirts that say, um, you know, Zoom University. We have shirts that say um, straight out of quarantine, you know, and you can make those posters or you can just buy those t-shirts and eventually we're going to put them in that time capsule with maybe some old cell phones or things like that. And then 20 years from now, we're going to be able to look at it and say, wow, wasn't that an interesting time in our lives? Absolutely. We so, have some of the shirts too because my son's birthday, his 21st birthday, hit over the quarantine. So we got shirts for that. And shirts are a creative way to deal with it. But every family is different. Right. And you don't have to buy the shirts. You can, you know, buy a shirt and write on it. I mean, it doesn't have to be an expensive item. Um, but it's also a, a creative time and a fun thing to do with your kids. Um, so, you know, just thinking of funny sayings and, um, and being able to wear them. Since nobody's really seeing them at this point, you know. Right. Um, it's more of a community, creating a family community experience. So we're all going through something together. And, and for some losses, it's harder to get to than others. Mm -hmm. But moving forward is always positive. So some of the other things that we, um, we should address is that children really do grieve differently than adults. So for adults, um, at the time of the loss or at the time of the death, they tend to begin their grief process. Um, and then they move through that process um, for as long as it takes. And, um, and there is no timeline for grief, as we all know. Um, and there is no specific way to go through grief. You know, you, you can bounce back and forth between different emotions and different experiences. But what we have found with children is that sometimes they have a delayed response. It's kind of like they're, they're contemplating it or they don't know how to experience it or they don't know what to call it. And so it may be overwhelming for them or they, it may not hit them the way it hits adults. And I think we need to be cognizant of that and, and really gentle with our kids. Like if they're starting to um, have behaviors that um, we, um, that are not, you know, in their normal wheel, you know, their no, normal um, way of coping. Um, we need to look at that and, and try to figure out what is going on for them. Um, so children can have delayed reactions to this. So they, you know, they might get to the, they may be doing really well um, from March until May and then the end of the year comes and that's when the grief reaction happens for them. That's when they start to realize, oh my goodness, now it's gonna be another three months before I see my friends. So they may be reacting to it now when you thought, well, why are they reacting now? They've, they've just, you know, been able to cope through the last um, eight or 10 weeks and, and now they're, they're starting to experience this. Um, we do find that children uh, tend to grieve in bursts that um, because these feelings are so overwhelming, you know, they may have these um, behaviors or, or emotional and physical experiences, but then it may shut down and they may be go, going back to playing and you're like, well, you know, what's going on? I thought we were in this grief process and now they're not experiencing this, so it seems. But children need to shut it down and they need to find a way to cope. So maybe they can only handle, you know, one piece of this at a time. And so they'll deal with it and then they'll stop and you'll think everything is okay and then they'll come back to it. Um, and we've seen that a lot, haven't we? In Absolutely. And the one other thing I want to add, Anne-Marie, for example, I knew some, some children whose father had died. And a day later, the kids were running around the house having a water gun fight, laughing and having a great time. 
and the mom was was concerned but she also was overwhelmed in her own grief and she's like is that uh an appropriate response, mm -hmm. but it truly is an appropriate response for children because they grieve in births and because they understand things bit by bit. So it is a process, it's ongoing, but taking some time out to have fun, to smile, to laugh again, is as much a tribute to the person they miss mm -hmm. and getting emotionally healthy in the end as it is the fact that their emotional responses just need a release mm -hmm. from all the intensity. So I, I think that we should follow suit with them and <laughs> do as they do. I think that they they have got this figured out better than we do. You know, we have to have those happy moments in our life, even on our, in our grief journey. Um, so maybe we need to take a lesson from our children and, and watch how they grieve and, and take those special moments um, to just be happy, to be happy in the moment that um, we're together. Or, you know, that Absolutely. Uh, so some of the ways that children may behave um, or some of the manifestations of grief, I guess, would be a better way for us to say that is they may act very silly, right? They, they, um, or they may be struggling. They may seem, you know, you're thinking they've been doing so well in school and now they're not or they're not paying attention, or they have what we call the ADD of grief, and we all get that um, in grief, I think, is we're distracted. We've got these, you know, we've got this uh, plate spinning, and then we have our grief spinning, and that's why we always say to parents um, or anyone who is grieving, when you get in the car, do not have your phone on, or, you know, put it some, put it on silent, because that is then a third piece um, of distractibility for you. So I think we need to really, um, you know, be cognizant of that and the fact that this is, this is a difficult process for them and they, they go through it very differently. Um, you know, their, their school performance may change, the way they interact with people may change, they may become impulsive, distracted, you know, um, or, or seem very angry and then be fine. You know, like, where did that come from, right? Um, so I think we need to be very cognizant of some of the things that they go through and um, how they experience grief differently. Um, Absolutely. And the one thing I would say about things like acting silly or being overly aggressive is adults, teachers, professionals, and the adults in their lives don't always see that as a grief response. Mm -hmm. But in understanding that there can be a grief response, then these unusual behaviors that we wouldn't usually see from them we would not associate being silly with grief. Adults wouldn't, but in children, that's extremely typical and it is one way to process it. Mm -hmm. I remember um, working with uh, a child very early in my career of grief um, where she climbed under a table. And my initial reaction was, oh, you know, she's just being difficult. And then I realized she was really trying to isolate herself. She was really trying to protect herself from what was going on in that room. The, the, the feelings of grief were so overwhelming to her that the only place she could really hide um, was under the table. And so what I ended up doing was actually climbing under the table with her and just processing some things. And um, it made, I think, such a difference for both of us and um, the relationship in terms of how she then came to the group the next time and processed grief. And there were times where she got under the table again. But because it was so overwhelming to her, I, that was my cue to say, wow, that she's really having greater difficulty today than, than normal with her grief. Um, and to kind of honor that and, and be respectful of that was the way that she was grieving. And, and that's the way she was letting me know that she was in pain. Um, Absolutely. And finding special spots to grieve is a way that children grieve. Mm -hmm. So that is another thing for parents and adults to keep in mind. 
is going out and sitting in a tree or going somewhere specific alone to grieve mm -hmm. may be part of the grieving process for them. Yes. Um, and sometimes just having a quiet place for to go with your child, you know, maybe just um, sitting in, in your backyard and, and putting a blanket out and maybe having like a little picnic lunch and just giving them time to center themselves. We all need chances to center ourselves and be present and mindful to the moment. Um, sometimes that's helpful to just quiet ourselves long enough to feel what we're feeling and, and to be able to express that um, and, and to share that with people, I think is such an important piece as well. Um, and sometimes children don't express it um, verbally. Many times they don't express it verbally, but we see it in their behaviors. Um, and we may see it with uh, nightmares they're having or, um, you know, frequently waking up or they may be more physically symptomatic. Um, headaches, you know, body aches. Um, there is a great book called The Body Keeps the Score that talks about trauma. And for some kids, this is a trauma response. Um, we really need to keep that in mind when we're working with children that they present in different ways uh, than adults. And we just really need to be in tune with what's going on for them. Absolutely, because so many times we feel led to, do we need to take them in? Do we need to have a professional um, doctor or something see them? And some of the stomach aches and some of the other anxious responses in the body may be reactions from grief, where once again, children react a little bit differently than adults, so we don't always recognize that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's so hard for us as parents to want to make it all right in the world for kids. You know, we, we want to make it okay. And this is just one of those experiences where we really can't make it okay. We can't bring back the person or, you know, if it's a, a loss of something and experience, we, we may not be able to, you know, make it all better for them. Um, and I think it's hard to sit there with our kids and, and to kind of feel that with them and to not be able to kind of be their hero. Um, you know, it's not necessarily something we can make better for them. Um, so we just have to let them know that it's okay and that um, if they want to talk about it, that they can do that. Um, and they may not come to us. They may... Um, we may have to go to them. They may never come to us and tell us what's going on. They may not think it's a big deal if, you know, they um, don't get to play their sport um, or they think it's a big deal, but they may not know that you think it's a big deal as well. So I often encourage people to share their experiences from, from a parent perspective of what's going on. And, uh, and, and children often want to hear that vulnerable place from grown-ups. A lot of times in America right now, we've tried to pave the way and make things very smooth for our kids. Mm -hmm. But often hearing about the times when things didn't go right in our childhood with those sports teams or other things can really be comforting to a kid. There are many generations that have gone through changes like this, where the grown-ups have not been able to make everything right in their child's world. Mm -hmm. So owning that and making children aware of that and the fact that we still love and care about them, those types of things still can be very comforting to kids. Mm -hmm. And some of the other things we can do is to be aware of emotionally how they may experience this. And I kind of skipped over that. but. Um, Children may become more anxious about things. Um, they may, um, you know, have an increased fear about, you know, parents leaving the home or other changes that are occurring for them. Um, they may have more safety concerns, especially with COVID-19 um, and, you know, physical safety of uh, for themselves and physical safety for the people around them. And they may feel very frightened 
by that. Um, they may not want to, you to go out, right? They may want you to have, be very close to them. Um, they may become more irritable or um, agitated. Um, they may not tell you what's going on. They, you know, the, they may not be able to express what they're feeling. Um, and they may even feel embarrassed by, you know, well, it's, you know, in the big picture, it's not such a big thing, but it is a big thing for them. Um, and I think that we need to recognize that and, and, you know, celebrate them as much as possible and just acknowledge their fears and their concerns and their pains um, and, and be aware of ours. You know, we, we're going through this too. We're going through COVID-19 and we're having a lot of responses to it as adults. Um, so I think we need to be aware of what our responses are as well to it all. So Faith, do you want to talk about how we can help children through grief? Sure. Um, probably the biggest thing to any child with or without grief is being present to them in their present moment really being involved in the moment that we're in is very, very helpful to any kid. Putting aside the cell phone and really focusing on what the child's saying is really, really important to them. Acknowledge their feelings. Validate that those feelings are regular feelings to have, but their feelings are feelings. And we have the ability to evaluate them and the ability to work through them so that feelings don't have to overcome us. Ask kids what they would like from you about how you can help them. Mm -hmm. Often they know what they want from the grown-up, but sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. And so, but just by asking, that does open the door. They may have something specific, like in their mind, it may just be, I want an ice cream cone to feel better. And we may think it goes much deeper than that. And other times it is something much deeper than that. But we never know till we ask. And, and um, listen to them. Reassure them. Give them attention. Hug them. Let them know they're loved and that their grief counts. And by acknowledging that everybody's going through something right now, that's usually very comforting mm -hmm. to students and to children. Yeah, let them know they're not alone. I think that's a very good thing to, to remind them that we're all going through this together and we're all experiencing it in different ways. And, and we have to talk to them. Um, you know, we don't want to give them too much information. Um, I often find it's better to ask my child what they know before I tell them um, too much um, because what, they, what they're what they integrating is what they can handle usually. Uh, so I, I often try to, I limit news in my home. Um, for me personally, it's, it's hard to listen to that all day long. Um, and, you know, it's it, it grates on you mentally, physically, in, in every way possible. Any place you go, you can find news about it. And, and I think we just need to put some controls in our place and, um, and look at what we can control and what we can't control in our lives right now. And that is one of the things I can control is what comes into my home in terms of news and, and experiences. Um, and I think we need to talk to them directly. Um, I have found, you know, that the students I've worked with have said, well, I can't even go outside. You can go outside. You can go outside your home. You can garden. It's an amazing experience. I know that that is one of the things that I have done a lot of this year is to, you know, take my shoes off and put my feet on the grass and in the ground and just garden and feel the earth. It, it, it's very grounding to do that. You know, put your hands in that dirt. It, it, it helps you feel centered. It helps you feel grounded. Um, and doing some fun stuff. You know, this is, this is an overwhelming time. So we have to learn how to be creative. And like you said, Pinterest is a great place to kind of get that information and, um, or talking to friends and saying, hey, so what are you doing this weekend? You know, we can still go hiking. 
We can still um, take walks in the park or in our neighborhood. We can talk to our neighbors from a distance. It's not like we have to stay in the house and, and be totally isolated from people. I think social distancing is different than social isolating. Um, and we have to look at that, but um, for, you know. Yeah, that is a huge distinction, Anne-Marie, is the difference between social distance and social isolating. I know also for some of the families that I know, they have created some great memories by creating music together or oh. by playing music and creating either dance videos or by each person taking an instrument and just kind of creating a song and a video. There are some tremendously creative videos on TikTok and other places, but also, it can just be for your own enjoyment and fun right. of together to make music together and work as a team mm -hmm. in creating a song, creating a video, let somebody direct. All those kind of things can make the experience really fun and a fun memory mm -hmm. that we would normally have time to create. Mm -hmm. But this gives us a unique time to do that. Yeah. Ask a, a teenager how to do a TikTok and do a TikTok with them. There are so many pandemic TikToks out there um, and that it's just, it's really been fun to watch some of the things that people are doing or saying or, you know, just being funny or, or just having fun together. Um, and wouldn't it be great for our kids to feel like the leaders and to, to teach us something, to teach us about, you know, well, this is how you do the TikTok, you know, and, um, and it's been a fun experience for me, I can assure you. Um, one of the things that we've done is to uh, cook together and, um, and we put music on and we just make all these kind of crazy meals and, and experience different, uh, different flavors. But it's been great to all be in the kitchen together, talking, laughing, listening to music and just, you know, just being together and being in our own safe place. It feels amazing to just be in our own safe place together. Um, and to know that no one in the world, you know, there's nothing in the world at that moment that can harm us. So it's a wonderful experience, I know for me. I love the fact that we've had to slow down. I think that if one of the things that comes out of this is to maybe reevaluate where we are and how much time we spend away from each other and to realize the importance of family and the importance of, of slowing down and spending time together. If, if I've learned nothing else through this pandemic, I've learned that I miss my family. Um, and that I don't get to spend enough time with them. It's really forced me to have to do that. Um, so some of the other coping strategies that we've identified is to, um, is to keep a routine in your home, um, that children do thrive on structure and consistency, and you are the structure and consistency that they so desperately need. Um, so if you take the reins in doing that, they will have what they need. Um, you can give them a journal. You can let them draw pictures about what this may look like for them. Sometimes kids can't express what they are feeling uh, verbally, but they're expressing it in how they're acting, or it, maybe they can express it in, um, in drawings or in songs or, um, you know, in some other ways. So we would encourage you to do that as well um, and encourage them to talk about their fears and their concerns and be open to them and just listen and you don't have to have all the answers i think that that's the key is no one at this point has all the answers and we can very easily say to them i don't know i'm waiting for that answer as well but this is what i'm going to do in the meantime this is how i'm going to survive through this and this is how i'm going to help you survive through this um so i think it's important that we let them know that we're there for them um if they're angry Give them a pillow to punch. Isn't it a great release? <laughs> Get a punching bag. Um, you know, let them know what's okay. You know, punching a wall is not okay, but punching the pillow is ripping up paper, you know, writing your feelings down and, um, and tearing them up is sometimes very freeing, isn't it? Absolutely. And just setting the boundaries on anger. 
this is the appropriate way to show anger. And it may be running around the block. It may be doing push-ups. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of appropriate ways to recognize anger and get it out. But the key thing is just to set boundaries on it for the whole household, because everybody is going to find something in this situation that makes them angry. Yes. We're, everybody in the household is dealing with a lot. Mm -hmm. So having appropriate boundaries for anger and, and coping skills for everybody to deal with those anger in the same agreed upon or similar ways is really, really helpful. Mm -mm. I agree. And the one thing that I would say is sometimes kids can't tell their parents everything they want to say. Um, and it's so important for them to have someone in their lives that they can go to and trust that will keep their information confidential. Someone that you trust as well. Um, for me, it's my sister. Um, and they know that what they say to her May, will not come to me unless there's a safety issue. Um, and they need to have that. And it's okay. They're not, you know, they're not traitors. They're, they're just finding a different person who understands them from a different perspective. Um, I think we've all, we, we all have people in our lives and we have different people for different things in our lives. And they have to have that too. Um, so, you know, they can get the information from their friends or they can get it from adults who um, are supportive and understanding and won't run back to mom. I think it's really important that they have that person in their lives. Um, and well, you go ahead. to build into kids the idea that no matter what stage of life you're in, you're going to need supportive people around you. Supportive people around you is part of a positive life. So when they go away to college or wherever, they need to have the concepts of how to build a supportive network. So allowing that to happen in bits and pieces as children are growing up is a positive thing. It, it shows that the grown-up loves them enough to release pieces of them, but at the same time, allow them to grow forward, but be there and be around them for the time that the child wants interaction with you, for you to be present in the present moment, but a person does not have to do it all. Children can have other supportive people around them, and that is still a positive thing. And it may have to be intentional growth. There are some people that don't have a lot of siblings, aunts, or uncles. So intentionally building supportive people into their life is something that they have to focus on and make an intentional development piece about. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, and we are also there to support them. Um, and we can talk to you know, people and, you know, anyone who needs assistance, them or their children. Um, and we're always happy to do that. It really does take a village. Um, and especially now, I think it's, it's in some ways easier to all come together um, as one to try to support each other through this and to, to be resilient and to help find those strategies. I thank you so much, Faith, for doing this with me. Um, and for Grace, who is our uh, amazing program coordinator, who Absolutely. worked so hard <laughs> to make this work for us. Yes, Grace did an amazing job on this. Mm -hmm. And it's always a pleasure for COJ to work with anyone who feels that they need additional supports in their life as far as their grief goes. I would encourage people to look at our Facebook page. There are padlets filled with different activities for children and families. Um, you know, maybe attend our Mending Hearts for Grieving Children program, um, both on Zoom and when we get back to uh, actually working in person. Um, but there are so many different resources for you to look at on our Facebook page. So I thank you for your time. And um, we hope to hear from you soon. Yes, thank you, Amory and Faith. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge. And thank you, everyone, for watching this. And we look forward to journeying alongside you.